Welcome, and thank you for signing in to OPWDD's Central Broker Authorization WebEx. My name is Chad Colarusso, and I am the Self-Direction Statewide Coordinator at OPWDD. This WebEx is being delivered as discussed during our June 13th Fiscal Intermediary and Support Broker Quarterly WebEx, and the intent, intention of this WebEx is to provide more information about the Central Broker Authorization process that is part of the new Support Broker Administrative Memoranda that will go into effect on July 1st, 2019. I will begin by providing some background information as to how and why Central Broker Authorization was developed. Central Broker Authorization is a direct response to recommendations made by Applied Self-Direction technical assistance consultants who reviewed OPWDD's self-direction program in 2017. Applied self-direction thoroughly assessed OPWDD's self-direction model and recommended ways to improve on it. One of their recommendations was to improve accountability for support brokers. The original suggestion was the elimination of the independent support broker option. However, the idea of eliminating independent support brokers was strongly opposed by advocates who expressed a strong desire to continue with independent broker model in order to allow them to work with the brokers of their choice. In response to that input, OPWDD decided to set up this central broker authorization process as a way to improve accountability while retaining the independent broker option. While accountability was the initial driver for this initiative, other aspects of the applied self-direction recommendations were also considered in developing the process. One of these recommendations is that OPWDD support mentorship for support brokers. Mentorship will now be supported by OPWDD and will be something which brokers can use to obtain training credits when they participate in the OPWDD mentorship program. This will be detailed later in the WebEx. In developing the central broker authorization process, we also look through the lens of the rec recommendation that OPWDD overall simplify the self-direction model. While we understand that issuing new rules and standards can seem complicated at the time of the change, we are confident that once implemented, stakeholders will recognize several aspects that will now make the service less confusing. Uh, examples include clarification around annual requirements, such as for training hours, as well as for those annual requirements for circle of support meetings. In addition, there is a reduction of circle of support meetings uh, minimally required from four to two, which will be better aligned with life plan meetings. Overall, this was looked at as a way to make the service simpler and more accessible. It's been about two years since the applied self direction direction recommendations, and this central broker authorization process has been development, in development ever since then. The concept was originally vetted and improved with stakeholder input. We also worked extensively with OPWDD regional staff who insisted in its development, and we would like, like to acknowledge them for their contributions. So now having provided that background, I'm going to turn the presentation over to another member of the, cent of the OPWDD self-direction team, Shobana Thamaraja, who is going to start providing details about the central broker authorization. Thank you, Chad. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shobana Thamaraja. I want to first take a moment to thank everyone who has joined this WebEx, especially as it was a short notice. We know that some of you are not able to join us due to time or conflict of schedule. You can get this information from your local DDRO liaisons. So we are going to talk about the ADM. I'm sure most of you have read the new ADM. Please make sure to review them. There is a typo error in the slide in the first bullet uh, the ADM is dated 2006. It should be 2005 ADM 2015-06 is replaced by ADM 2019-06, effective July 1st. So we are just going to go through the summary of the changes of the ADM. 
that are small changes in language and structure for clarity and consistency. We have updated the language to be consistent with the CCO implementation, like ISP to life plan, MSC to care managers. Also added section title, billing for support broker service delivered without the individual present. A lot of support brokers have always asked the question, can we bill when the individual is not present? It is very clearly written in the ADM with lots of uh, examples. Support broker can bill when the individual is not physically present next to them. Revised circle of support meeting requirement. It used to be four times per year. Now it is two times per year. This is a basic requirement. If individuals need more, you can have more. We still recommend four times if possible. We have already received multiple questions regarding when does this become effective. This ADM is effective July 1st. The reason why everyone asks, when do we count two per the audit? Auditors will sample a claim that occurred in the past, then apply the standard in effect for the claim. So if the support broker's date of service is 7-1-2019 or later, the auditor would apply the new standard, that is, was there at least two circle of support meeting in the prior year in the case where the time frame applies, like support broker agreement and the budget in effective with the support broker. However, for a service that occurs on 6-30-2019, the current standard will apply. That is going to be back to a year from 6.30, where the broker service has existed at least a year prior to 6.30. I hope this helps people understand why a four circle of meeting is to be two. two. Back to the changes to the ADM. We have added examples to clarify the circumstance where one meeting or two meeting would be required. Explain face-to-face -face requirements. Support broker has to be present physically for circle of support meeting, planning meeting. It's still not allowed to Skype or telephone or WebEx and so. You have, brokers have to be physically present next to the individual. Revised billing language so that it ties to the support broker billing to the central broker authorization. Regarding the qualification and training requirements are now present in ADM 2019-05. We have added ISP slash life plan section four documentation guidelines. These are the main highlights of the ADM. Coming to the brand new ADM, the 2019-05 is a really new ADM. I, we want to stress as much as we can. Please, brokers, SIs, please review them. Make sure you understand them. Authorization standards, the name of the ADM is Authorization Standards for Support Broker. We want to share the highlights. The first thing is about the initial training requirements. This has not changed. This is not changed for the current brokers who are listening to this WebEx. It is for the brokers who are going to be after the August 1st, 2019. So the initial broker training requirement, which is addressed in the ADM, is only for the brokers who are going to become brokers after August 1st, 2019. So we want to make sure that is very clear. It's not for the current brokers who are listening to this WebEx. Current brokers also do not have to submit the initial trainings to OPWDD. The ADM states where the forms are available. At this time, it is not in the website, so I want to stress on that and make sure you guys are not going on the website searching for the forms. It's not on the website yet. 
It'll be on the website soon. We will notify the DDROs when the forms are uploaded to the website. So please reach out to your DDROs. The authorization form has been shared to the DDROs yesterday, and I'm happy to say that some of you have already started filling the forms and sending it to us. Um, so the form is being shared to the DDROs and they have shared to the FIs and brokers. So please fill them. You, it's also available on the SMLS. If you have registered through SMLS, it is in the resource. So back to the ADM, the annual authorization, the second year the broker will have to be reauthorized. So this is just for the first year that the form has been shared. The next year they will have to, all the brokers will have to go through reauthorization. There is still the yearly training requirements are the same, 12 years, the, uh, 12 hours minimum. We will talk more in depth in the next few slides. Broker review, there is a section that talks about broker expectation and potential corrective action. So it very clearly defines in the ADM about the expectations and the um, potential corrective actions that will be taken. We really do understand the value of support brokers. The ones who are listening today, we do understand how important support brokers are for self-direction services. And there is a lot of expectations for support brokers. And I do understand many of you all go over and beyond your standards of being a support broker. We are very thankful. This basically is to help you and the individuals and the FI. So I want to stress on that. We are happy for brokers. We want more brokers um, to help the individuals that we serve. So just like any of our jobs, we have to have some regulation and guidelines, especially because support broker service is a Medicaid waiver service. So we want to make sure there is a guidelines. That is why these things have been created. As Chad stressed on it in the beginning, it is to help everybody. The most important is that if there is any kind of allegations or any um, expectations are sent to us, it will be reviewed individually. Independent brokers are still accountable to individuals, FI, DDRO, and Medicaid roles. So I want to make sure that just because you get an authorization number doesn't mean you're not to be answered to FIs or DDROs or individuals. They are still your point people. So the next part of the ADM, that uh, last part of the ADM is lapse in authorization. In case a support broker does not obtain reauthorization, the broker can become a broker again. They will need to follow the initial training and the authorization process. This is an important information. Please read the ADMs carefully. Please reach out to your DDROs if you have any questions. Some of this information was already shared on 613 WebEx, so it might sound like a repetition. And I do know that I spoke a little bit more about it. We want to make sure this is very carefully reviewed by support brokers and FI. So we want to talk about what support brokers, what do you all have to do to submit the forms? Support brokers, what does this mean to the current brokers that is listening, who are listening to this WebEx? When you submit the forms with all the correct information, you will be issued a five-digit authorization number. So it is a five-digit number. We are going to talk more in the next few slides about the form and the uh, authorization number. This is just a heads up to let you guys know it's a five-digit number. Support broker cannot bill for services after August 1st without an authorization number. So that 
we are stressing on that to let you guys know how important it is to send, fill the forms and send it to us in a timely manner way before August 1st. So you have the number. So if you do services, you can bill for them. The standard is the same for agency brokers and independent brokers. Authorization numbers, once you receive them, must be included in the self-direction budget, cost-neutral budget amendment, support broker agreement that was created or signed in the effect on or after August 1st. So any forms or uh, any forms the support broker use, make sure these numbers are included. The budgets still states broker certification, please enter your authorization number. We will be changing the budget template and updating it soon. Once it's updated, we will notify the DDROs and the support brokers and FIs. So as of now, the template does say budget cert uh, broker certification. So please use your authorization number once you have it when you do the new budgets going forward. Support broker agreement and termination forms are also updated. It will be available on OPWDD website soon. So please don't recreate the existing forms. As soon as you get a number, don't go creating a form. We have already done that. It will be shared with you support brokers and everybody on the website and your local DDRO will also have that. Support brokers will not necessarily be required to provide training documentation to each FI, which is a good thing, I feel. But at the same time, if some of the FIs want that requirement and it is in their MOU or letter, uh, letter of agreement, support brokers can send their training requirements to the FI. If the FIs don't require it, FIs can verify the eligibility through OPWDD. So FIs can reach out to us and we will let you know if they have done their training for the coming year. Shumana, I just want to jump in and elaborate on one point that you made regarding the, the documentation, which was um, you know, we have updated some of the documentation elements for the new standards and the new ADM, specifically the inclusion of the authorization number. And as Shobhana said, for the OPWDD issued templates, um, we have created uh, new form templates that will be available for support brokers and FIs and participants to access and use. They'll be posted on the OPWDD website soon. Um, that, that said, for the service documentation, as before, um, those are templates. Um, there's not a mandate that you use the OPWDD issued form. Um, so agencies that are creating their own forms or doing the forms in electronic systems, um, you know, those those can be can be updated at any time as of July 1st to incorporate the new um, the new standard. Um, but for anybody looking at and using the OPWDD form. Um, again, those will, will be updated and the new forms will not be required for use until, until August 1st, 2019. Another topic I want to touch on, again, something, something Shobhan did not mention, but because we've received so many questions and we're continuing to receive a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A, has to do with the transition of people's circle of support years. Um, we've received a lot of queries on people wondering um, how their circle of support year will, will be applied um, as it changes with this July 1st effective date for the ADM and the reduction of the, um, of the minimally required circle of support face-to-face -face meetings from four to two. And the way to look at, the best way to look at this is to remember that when OPWDD or OMEG or any other auditors are looking at it, a broker service, they're going to consider the date of the service, um, which is the, the date and the Medicaid claim, and, um, and then they're going to apply the standard that was in effect. So 
for a broker service delivered today, what an auditor will do is look backwards one full year and look for was there four face-to-face -face meetings delivered in that in that time period to um, to meet this, assuming that there was in fact a full year of brokerage. As of July 1st, if the claim is dated July 1st, they're going to look backwards a full year and apply the standard of were there at least two meetings if there had been brokers for that year. So as this is a reduction in the requirement, anybody who's been in compliance or at least been halfway in compliance as of July 1st um, will not have to um, have anything to worry about as the, as the standard changes from four to two. Um, you know, for the future for compliance perspective, the way to look at it is remember to think when the claim happens, going backwards a year, so in, in that one year period, has there in fact um, been a, um, been at least uh, two meetings, two meetings going forward. And of course, the, the start date for that, when you have to start counting for that year, will be very clear with these new standards. Again, that's tied to the signature on the support broker agreement and then going um, a year forward for your practical purposes, but again, for audit purposes, they're going to look at a claim and go backwards a year, um, which gets a little bit a little bit confusing, but if you think about that in the sense of the transition, it, it should make for a fairly easy transition, and we don't see circumstances where that's going to put anybody out of compliance due to the new standard. In fact, it should um, help a lot of people due to the fact that it's it's diminishing the the established requirement that's current, um, again, from four to two as a, as a bare minimum. Thank you, Chair. So to continue, what does this um, affect the current brokers? The great news is the authorization is statewide. So that being said, support brokers will not need to be added to the approval list at each OPWDD district office. So it's one number for anybody in the New York State. All support broker will have the same year of um, great, this is a great news to support brokers and FI, so no more confusing of when is my training year, when did we start it, you won't have that confusion anymore. That starts as of August 1st. So for the time being, if it is still a confusion, please reach out to your local DDRO. They will be happy to help you. So everyone will have the same training year starting as of August 1st. Unpaid brokers will not be required to be, uh, to be uh, sorry, will not be required to be uh, having an authorization number. The process for establishing an unpaid broker has has completed training to be determined by the DDRO. So the, the DDROs will still have the list of the unpaid uh, broker list, and they will be tracking your trainings at the local DDROs. If someone is working in as an unpaid capacity and wishes to start billing for a service, then they can apply for an authorization number. So. Unpaid brokers, there is no billing. That is why they don't need an authorization number. They can leave the fields on the forms empty in the budget or in a cost neutral budget amendment or in a support broker agreement. Unpaid brokers can leave the authorization field empty or you can use the 999, the five, five nines because that is the non-value for any program. So unpaid brokers, if you want to use the number, you can use the 999. Make sure it's five nines because the authorization number is a five-digit number. The next slide is standards that is not impacted. So I know a lot of FIs and a lot of brokers, they, you guys still ask, are we still supposed to do the background checks? Yes, you will still continue to do the basic requirements of the fingerprints, MHL, CBC, and so on. 
that hasn't changed because you have an authorization number. At this point, every broker, every independent broker who works with different FIs will have to go through this process per the FIs requirements. There's no change to it. Authorization does not impact the service standards. If a support broker is in an exclusion list, they will be removed from the authorization. It does not supersede the Medicaid standards. So once again, because you have an authorization number doesn't mean it supersedes the medication, uh, Medicaid exclusion list. Support brokers and FI, I want to make sure that you retain all the service documentation that is necessary to justify your billing prior to August 1st, 2019, in accordance with the ADM 2015-06. So it is the requirement of the brokers and the FI to retain any documentation. Because you have an authorization number doesn't mean you don't retain the document. So a retention process is the same for all the services. So we would like to show you guys the forms, the authorization form. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen the form that was sent out. Um, so we are just pulling up the form so everybody can view it. Give us one minute for just showing the form. I, I'm sure everybody can view it now. So I want to show, do a demo form so it is very clear to everyone how it is done. I've created a person's name. It's just a fake name. So here's the form. It's called the Support Broker Authorization Form. So. Let's try to see how we can fill this form and walk you guys through. Last name, Smith. First name, now, middle initial is just one letter. So if you try to enter more than one letter, it is not going to allow you. So the middle initial is just one letter. If you have an alternate name, please use that. If not, you can leave it blank. Business street address. I just created an address so it's easy. 123 Main Street. There's always a Main Street everywhere. City, East Greenbush. It's, it's a very easy form. It's not complicated at all. The state, you can only put two letters, so New York, NY. Zip code, you cannot enter um, letters. You can only enter the numbers, not more than the digits. Phone, phone number, you can just enter a phone number. You don't have to put a space or anything. So 518-621-7374. As soon as you enter, it, it automatically puts the space in between. Number of the participants currently saved. Please make sure it's not the number that you have agreed upon it has to match with your support broker agreement. So if you have signed a support broker agreement, that's what you have to put in. So in this case, I'm putting in four participants that Nal Smith is working with. Email address, make sure you write your business email, please don't write. If you have a Facebook account or anything, don't give, a, give it out. I, I'm sure you don't want to share those information with everybody. Um, so make sure you use the accurate personal business email that you give it to DDROs and families. Name of the agency, if you are an independent broker, please write independent broker. If not, if you're an agency broker, 
please write the name of the agency. I'm just writing name of the agency. So, and so make sure you write whether you are an independent broker or if you are an agency broker, please write agency broker. Please check if you wish to be included in the public version of registry. If you want to be, if you want to still take more cases and want to share this with your DDROs, individuals, MSCs, please, it's a check mark. As soon as you hit enter, it's a check mark. It's very easy. So, Section two, broker list you are currently included in. This just gives us an understanding of where you want to serve. So if you is Greenbush, so I selected Capital District is one place that you would want to work with. Um, unless you want to uh, travel four to six hours a day to meet any clients. If you wish to do so, you can click somewhere Long Island, but um, I'm just clicking that and going to section three. The years of service as a support broker, you can enter if you have worked for a year and a half, if you enter a year and a half, it's going to round up to two. So here you can see, if I put 1.5 years, it's going to, as soon as I put press enter, it's going to round up, not down. So it's going to be two. So don't try to think you made an error. It's just rounding up. Number of participants that you have an active support broker agreement. This is checking, this is a repetition to the section one. This is just making sure you have entered the right numbers. So, we know a lot of brokers know a lot of additional language. Sometimes it does help a lot of individuals when you know other language. English being the basic language, a preferred language for many people, you don't have to do that. But there are 19 languages that you can select from this. Isn't that beautiful that some people know more than two languages? It's an amazing thing. So one of the languages that commonly I thought people do know is Spanish. So if you go down, it's just, you click on Spanish. Next one, you click, I pick French. Something that I thought will be fascinating was Greek. And many of you do know that some individuals and you can communicate with American Sign Language. So those were the language that Null Smith knows about. So sorry, because I clicked too fast, it changed from American Sign Language to something else. We don't want that happening. And I don't think I want that language. So. Nothing wrong with that. So, section four, which counties do you want to work? This helps if you want to share with um, DDROs and families. So, you can, because you are a statewide, New York statewide, this number is authorized for New York statewide, but this helps you that you would like to work within these counties. So, Albany. Check mark, it's just a click and it checks. And then Columbia County, Green County, um, Schenectady. I'm just going down the form. It's a, as I'm saying, the form is so easy, it's not complicated at all.
So those are the things that just check broker profile. It's just a little description about you guys, what you want to share with individuals and families and care managers. So love, you can type it out, love working with IDD population. I am uh, LPN, um, master's degree in early intervention. Just uh, I, I was typing even without looking, so I put some additional things in there. early intervention. So anything that you think will be nice that you would want to share, y'all can write that. Some of the brokers do have some specialized skills, so you can type in like, because um, Null Smith is an LPN, um, I'm writing that they have a good knowledge on medication. So, holistic approach. Um, love to work with kids. So, small explanation in depth. Next section is your agency contact information. If you work for an agency, please enter those information, the name of the agency the contact person of your agency, like your supervisor's name. The address of your agency, the email of your supervisor, and their phone number, because you have already entered your information. So if Nal Smith is working for an agency, Nal Smith will write the agency's name, and then Nal Smith's supervisor's name and the supervisor's email and phone number and the address. And the signature is an electronic signature, so when you click on it, it's going to give, because chat has, um, is the presenter for the WebEx, you can see it automatically says chat. So if you follow this link below, it's going to show you how to do your e-signature if you have not created an e-signature on your computers. So just follow the steps. So that's how easy the form is. Yeah. Um, um, so make, the form is on Adobe. Um, it's created on Adobe style. So if you don't have that, please make sure you up, uh, upload an Adobe um, Pro or something like that so you can use this form. Then it's easy to save the form. If you use your own browser, it is not easy to form. Sorry, I missed a piece on the form. Um, it's the last piece. I'm not going back. I'm just going to say it is important to enter the participants that you work with. So you can see, please, the name of the participant and ta uh, tabs ID. Please write whomever you are serving for. So in this case, it was Null Smith. He was having four people in his caseload. So he's going to enter the four names of the participant and their tab ID. So that is important. So if you have more than that, please enter those information. It's important to put the tab ID because 
there are a lot of people with the same names. We don't want to confuse anybody. So please make sure it's the right information. And that is the instructions on the form. It explains very clearly. It's well written. It's exactly as what I had explained as I was filling the form. The most important thing that I want to tell about the form is you cannot print the form. You have to save it. When you're done filling the form, save it. Put a file name. Put your name as your file name. So in this case, the file name will be Null Smith and then send it electronically to the SD broker mailbox. So it very clearly says, after signing, save the file. You can save the file with your name and send it to the SD broker mailbox. I also want to make a point here. A lot of brokers are like backup brokers for others. If you are a backup broker you and you have an if you have signed a support broker agreement and you're a backup broker, you have to still fill those information in the participant schedule. So that's about the forms. I'm sure everybody's excited to fill these forms and send it to me. Uh, we will start reviewing it. I'm sure by now when I go back to my mailbox, there's going to be lots of forms. I'm happy. Please take your time fill them and send it to us in way before August 1st, so you have the authorization number. All current brokers have to fill and submit the forms via email to sdbroker at opwdd.ny.gov. So that's the mailbox that you're going to send the forms to. Once again, you can not print the form. No handwritten forms will be accepted. Please send it in an electronic version. The forms were already sent to the DDRO and many of the brokers have received it. Make sure that you fill them and send it to us. This authorization form is for a year. That is from August 1st 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. to July 31st, 2020. So this form is for the first year. Whoever is listening to this website, please make sure to fill this form and send it to us. If you do not submit, brokers cannot bill from August 1st until you have an effective date of the authorization number. If there is a false information in this form, again, if it is a false information, it is an automatic revocation for the numbers. So, but I just want to jump in real quick and scanning through the, the Q&A um, and also seeing um, my email box blowing up with requests for this form. I um, want to reiterate again that the form is currently available through a number of means. Um, it can be obtained for anybody who registered in the statewide learning management system for this course. Uh, this form is, a, is one of the four resources, um, the PowerPoint as a PDF, uh, both of the new support broker ADMs as well as the support broker authorization form that Shobana just went through in detail. All of those documents were posted as resources to this training, so you can actually get them. The most, the most direct way you can get them is right from your statewide learning management system account, which you use to register and attend this training. The forms are available there. Um, there's good information if you're having any kind of technical difficulties navigating that to contact OPWDD's talent and develop, talent development and training department, um, and they can help you out. It's really worthwhile to get familiar with the statewide learning management system now. Um, you know, as we go forward in the future, looking at more trainings, we do intend to continue using 
that online um, learning management system. So, you know, there's there's no better time than the present to um, start getting familiar with it, uh, and that is a, a good primary source to get the forms. You can also contact any of your local self-direction liaisons. They will be able to send you the authorization form or those other documents as well. And um, and as a as a last resort, you can use the self SD broker at opwdd.ny.gov, which is displayed on the current slide and will be displayed again later. Um, if you if you submit requests, we will try to get to that. But again, that email is primarily for processing authorizations. Um, so that would be a, a last resort. You're, we, we recommend first trying to get the form directly from the State Weather Management System. If that doesn't work, contact your local self-direction liaison. Um, and as a fail-safe, you can contact the SD broker email in order to get the form. Thank you, Chad. So going to the broker list and support broker agreements. There will be a verification list available that contains the name of the support broker, city, authorization number, and the effective date of the authorization. So the verification list has only the name of the broker, the city where the broker lives, the authorization number, the effective date of the authorization. This list will be used primarily by the FI. So FIs, that's when your years, as soon as I say FI, all the FIs years pop up. I can see that uh, it's important for the FI to verify the authorization before processing a support, break, uh, support broker's claims for billing. So it is important that the FIs verify that the broker authorization number is available in this list. So how is the FI going to get this list? So there's two ways. It will be also shared on the website. We will be also sending this, e uh, this via email to the FIs. Make sure FIs keep the copy. You should keep the copy. It's not a requirement. It's just the best practice. When we send out these lists, keep a copy. Um, as the website will only have the most current version. So if you're going six years back later uh, to look at if the broker had a broker authorization number, the website will only have the current people. So it is the best practice that we are going to say is to keep these uh, in your file because the auditors will want to look at the list. We will also share this information to the auditors. So there is two versions, as I described, as the uh, verification list and the public version. So when I showed you the forms, if the support broker checks the mark for public version, which is an optional, not all brokers need to check it to see that they want to be on the public version. So if you check the check the public version checklist on the form, we will create a list that will be shared to the DDROs. And this list will be shared to individuals, parents, family members, and care managers. So basically, this will look like the same list that brand new families, if they're looking for brokers, they can reach up to you guys to see if you want to pick up any new cases. As mentioned earlier, there is a new support broker agreement form. Um, as Chad stressed on it, this is a form that we will share if agencies want to use it or you can use it or it's a backup which has the broker authorization number slot in it. Going forward, it's important that the support brokers or the FI, so it's either the support broker or the FI can send the support broker agreements to central office. So all this time, support brokers used to sign the agreements, the participant signs the agreements, 
sends it to the DDRO. Going forward, it is also important important to send the support broker agreement to central office via the SD broker mailbox. So going to the training, the next most important thing and most commonly asked question is about training. So the first thing is about initial training. When I uh, shared about the ADM, we did say that the initial training is only for the brand new brokers. So what I am sharing now is for the brokers who are going to become brokers after August 1st. So this is not for the brokers who are listening now. So the initial training for new brokers will be the same, self-advocacy, self-determination, person-centered planning, both the introduction and advance, BTI, Broker Training Institute, uh, the budget template. The change is the brokers after August 1st will have to do the six trainings prior to getting the authorization number. So they have to show us proof that they have done the trainings for privacy and security of health information, overview of developmental disability, Medicaid compliance, FICA, if working with an individual for whom this training would be relevant, praise, rights, and responsibility. So all these trainings needs to be completed by a new broker starting August 1st in order to get the authorization number. So. It's important for people to know that. That being said, if brokers don't, the current brokers who are listening to this WebEx, if you do not send us the forms by August 1st, you will have to go through these initial trainings again. So that's why this slide is, um, is in, this, uh, in this WebEx. The yearly training. There is no change. The current brokers will have to do the 12 hours of training minimum. That has not changed. To be reauthorized next year, brokers will complete and submit the reauthorization form between April 1st and July 31st and attach the proof of completion for the 12 hours. So the next year, brokers will have to submit a reauthorization form and also show the proof of the completion of the 12 hours. The forms will be once again published later. So for example, reauthorizing for August 1st, 2020, training must have occurred between either your initial effective date or August 1st, 2019 whichever comes later, and, and July 31st, 2020. So next year, from August 1st, 2020, you will have to show us the 12-hour training so we have the proof to in order to get reauthorized. So, you would have noticed that there is a prorated yearly training in the ADM, which is very clear. It, this is for brokers who become brokers after August 1st. So from August 1st to October 31st, if you are a broker and you have an authorization number, the training is 12 hours, no change. Anybody who is a current broker effective August 1st, your requirements is 12 hours. There is no change to it. If a broker becomes a broker on November 1st or November 30th, they will do nine hours training. So they're not rushing to get to do the 12 hour training. If anyone becomes a broker on May 30th, for example, they will only have to do three-hour training. 
so it is very easy. It's not making the broker stress that they have to do 12-hour training. I think it's such a useful thing for brokers to know that it is a shorter one if you all become brokers later. It's an advantage for the new broker. So I'm just going to advise you, a lot of people are asking just if you, you, you touched on it, but just to clarify on um, people are asking if you want them for existing brokers to send you their, um, uh, their annual training verifications for, um, for last year, or if you were talking about going forward for next year's reauthorization. Do you mind just speaking to that because yes. it's uh, generating a lot of questions? Um, please don't send your current year training to me because it's going to fill up our mailbox. We want to make sure that your authorization form is the most priority. We do not need any form of um, any forms attached to any emails proving your 12-hour training for this year. This yearly professional training for the 12-hour is for the next year starting August 1st, not for the, anything before August 1st. So please don't send your trainings. I'm not going to check them. Thanks, Shobana. You know, and again, just to reiterate, the basis for the grandfathering in, that is current brokers, which um, I, I would assume is the vast majority of people attending this WebEx. Um, what, will, what will get you in as part of being grandfathered for this first year authorization is the fact, primarily the fact that you are currently on an approved list at a district. That is, that is the information that, that we're looking to, looking to confirm as part of this initial authorization process. We do not need all of um, the information from the last year to verify that if you are in good standing with the district um, as part of the transition to authorization and you timely submit and complete the form so we have the needed information, that is all that is going to be required for the first year grandfather. Going forward for next year, um, there will be the annual reauthorization, which again is very similar to the standards that already exists in terms of brokers needing to um, obtain the 12 hours of credit and, um, and complete those annual trainings. The difference being now instead of having to send that information to all of the FIs and districts you might work with, you will now be sending it to one central place and that will constitute your authorization, which is what the districts and fiscal intermediaries will verify instead of needing to verify each individual aspect of, um, of a, broker's, a broker's training. Um, so that's what annual authorization becomes, but that does not need to be vetted until your reauthorization um, taking place about a year from now. Make sure you guys have completed your 12-hour training so the FIs and DDROs are not notifying us with any scenario. So if you have any training that is before August 1st, 2019, please make sure to do the training. Thank you, Chad. So the next one is the mentorship program, which Chad had also explained. It is one of the newest thing, and it is highly recommended by applied um, by Applied Self-Direction's recommendation was to have the mentorship program. So we are hoping this will help a lot of brand new brokers um, to do this. This is also to help brokers, which will add to their training. So this, if you become a mentor, you can have the six hours of yearly professional training based on your mentorship. So. Credits for uh, mentorship can include time spent like completion or updating um, staff, staff action plans, sorry. We have given you some examples of how this mentorship can, me, mentorship or a mentor can help the uh, protege. So it's also 
um, like doing helping in self-direction budgets, attendance of the circle of support meeting. It does also say the development of life plan. We know for sure that is the role of the care manager, and the care manager is the author of the life plan, but brokers are the essential part with the individual to develop the life plan. So that is why it is written as development of life plan. So the brokers can go to the life plan meeting, help the individual, and make sure um, they can develop the life plan. A any use of protected health information must be approved by the individual who received the services. So because you're sharing the staff action plans or life plans, it has a lot of, uh, of protected health insurance. Um, health information, sorry. So make sure the individual know that you're sharing these information. Also let the care managers, FIs, and other members of the circle of support who needs to know that you're going to share this information. When submitting for reauthorization, both mentor and protege should complete and submit a mentorship form with the reauthorization form. So again, this is for the next year, not for this year. So when you're going to go to say that you want to um, be reauthorized to become a mentor, it's for the next year. You will fill the form, attach the mentorship form with it to um, for the next year that you want to be. So the mentor program role. How do you become a mentor? So when we talk about mentorship and everybody wants to like, hey, I want to become a mentor, how do you become a mentor is something that everybody wants to know about. Um, there is a form. Again, we are keeping on saying there are so many forms which we will be sharing soon, and it will be also available online. We shared the first most important form, the authorization form. So I think that gives enough time for the brokers to fill those and send it to us. There is a mentor form, which you will see soon. So that being said, who will become a broker or how? So experienced brokers approved by OPWDD can become a mentor. So literally, everyone who is a support broker today, if you want to become a mentor, you will have to reach up to your DDROs once you have the form. You will complete the form, submit it to the DDRO. The DDRO will forward it to us, for, and we will uh, make sure it is approved or not. If you get a notification, will be sent to the support broker via email to say if you uh, become a mentor or not. Once you receive that email, that is the effective date of you being the mentor. So this is not the authorization number date. When you fill the mentor form and submit to DDRO and we send an email to the broker, that date is the effective date of you becoming a mentor. So make sure you have that email as your backup saying that you have become the mentor. So who is that who is going to be a protege? Anybody, any new brokers before the end of the first authorization year, so anybody, literally any newbies, any, uh, anyone who wants to learn to be a broker and who's already got an authorization number within their first year is what the mentor can help that broker. So that is the most important thing to know. Upfront approval is not required for eligibility, but they are advised to make sure mentor is approved. So it is important that you ask the mentor that they are approved to become mentors. So 
um, you can do the program together and uh, submit for training. I just want to pause for a minute to ask if there was any more questions regarding the mentorship. So the most common question being asked about um, payments, uh, about mentorship is regarding payments and people wanting to know if they can um, be paid or if there's service available to pay for mentors being mentors. So as you all know already, to get to be having the 12-hour training, you cannot get paid. So the simple answer is when you are doing the mentorship, it is calculating towards your training of your 12-hour training for a maximum of six hours. So it's it is a mentor is completing it in order to get the training hours. So simple answer is you're not getting paid. It's an additional qualification for you. You can write it in your resume that you were a mentor, but it is you're not going to get paid for it. I hope I answered it very clearly. Thank you. That does help. And then a lot of other people want to know um, if both the mentor and the, um, and the protege are eligible to receive training credits. So it's um, three hours. It, the, Clear answer is yes, both of you will get the training hours. So six, if it is six hours, six, uh, three hours for the mentor, three hours for the protege. Okay, thank you. Those were the, those were the main trended questions that, that came up, um, though, as we received before. The other question is, um, um, can you reiterate the time frame for when somebody could be considered for as a potential mentee? So the men, mentee is the protege. Yep. So that is the, it's before the end of the first authorization year. So say a broker becomes a broker on October 1st of 2019. So from October 1st, 2019, to that year ends, the authorization ends, you can become a protege. I hope that is clear. So does that mean that people who are going to be grandfathered yes. in as, um, as authorized brokers as part of this transition would not be eligible to be protégés? That is absolutely correct. So this is, that's why I use the word newbies. You guys are already grandfathered. You're already brokers. So you are the ones who are going to become the mentors. So that's the best thing that I can tell you. Not every broker is going to be a mentor, so I don't want you to take that from this WebEx, thinking that whoever is present today is going to become mentors. You will have to fill the form, submit to DDROs. We will make sure that you become a mentor. If there's some, um, if not everybody can become mentors. If you don't get an email, that means you didn't become a mentor. That doesn't mean that also says next year you can apply to become a mentor. So if this year you were not granted as a mentor, doesn't mean you can never become mentors. You can reapply next year to become mentors. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. Can you go over a couple of people have asked for a repetition on the um, health information privacy aspect of of this uh, mentorship program, and because that's so important, and um, I think I think you know it's going through everything. Just if you mind going back and just uh, reiterating some of the important aspects of that. So when you're a mentor and protege, you're sharing a individual who's receiving the service, their Medicaid numbers, their budgets. These are all the most important um, health information or anything like that, their Medicaid information and all those things. So you do not want to just take it and give it to the protege or pro, uh, mentor sharing it. It is important that the individual knows 
you're sharing and they're okay with it. That's the most, and also the FIs might have some clause that you they prohibit you from sharing the protected health information. That's why we are saying make sure the FIs are also aware that you are sharing um, the budget or staff action plan, life plans, and one of the things that mentor can do is go to circle support meetings. So you don't want to bring a mentor to a circle support meeting without the individual knowing because it's their meeting. They need to know who's coming to their meeting. So you don't want somebody suddenly showing up for the individual's meeting. Oh, hi, I'm the mentor for the broker. The individual needs to know somebody is coming for the meeting. So that's why it's important that you let everybody know that you're sharing and it's okay to share. If any one of them refuse, that you cannot do it, please find out why and take the needed steps for it. Okay. Thanks, Shobhana. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on. I mean, there's, there's a lot more questions here on, on everything, but just to, just to continue in the time we have, and as, as we transition to the next section, um, you know, one question that's coming up, we have a lot of fiscal intermediary representatives on the call here too, and um, you know, are asking where they'll be able to receive authorization information from. Is that something you can touch on quickly, please? So I know the FIs want to know where is this authorization number. As I described, it'll, it is a verification list. So any brokers who submits the authorization form will correctly will have an authorization number which will be on the verification list which will be available on the website. We will also make sure to send the form, the list, sorry, not the form, the list to the FIs. So every 15 days is our plan to send this out to the FIs so you can have it with you guys. Um, with the broker authorization number. I hope that answers the question. The FIs can have it. You can keep it. Um, it will be there on the website. And we will send where to look in the website once we have at least 15 brokers who have applied this authorization form. So please don't go searching for it today or tomorrow. We will uh, send a blast email. We will also make sure that being said, we'll also make sure all the FIs email we have are current. So we have thought about a plan for it. So if you if your email is not there, please send it to the DDROs. We will get an updated list from them. Um, you will have the list uh, with the numbers, names, and things as we described earlier. So back to the slides, the next most important thing is the broker review and oversight. As Chad described why this authorization was found or created and it started was to find accountability for brokers. As I described again, support brokers, you guys do a great job, you all are like the most important players along with the individual for self-direction service. But just like anybody, we all have a job. There should be some kind of accountability. That is why this was created. I want to stress again, this is not to scare brokers. It is to help you. The broker review process is also to help brokers FIs, individuals, and everybody who is a part of self-direction service. So if any complaints or issues that the individual or family has, you still need to go directly to your DDRO. So they are the point person. The DDRO is the one who gives you the list of the brokers, who tells you about self-direction. They are the most important people. So. 
any families or individual, if you have any complaints about brokers, please reach out to the DDRO. The same with the brokers. Brokers, DDRO is the one who still does the BTI training, do their monthly meetings with you guys. They know you. So if you have any issues, reach out to your local DDRO liaison. The complaints must be a clear statement of the incident involved and support information. You have to, you cannot send like a blanket thing saying um, support broker didn't show up for a meeting. It needs to be a clear statement. If there is documentation that you can attach to it, please send that. F5, this can forward any issues to the central office directly. So please, FIs, if you have any issues with your brokers and you want to share it, you can send it to the SD broker mailbox. Central broker, um, so the central office will review and submit the compliance and make a determination. So just because you send one, we're not going to take an action immediately. We're going to review them. It's going to be looked at it case by case. If the matter is not within the scope of the program, we will archive the complaint, but not in, um, but no immediate action will be taken. So just because somebody sent it, but it is not a part of self-direction, it's something else that the broker did in another job that they do, we are not going to take any actions because it doesn't have to do anything with self-direction. We will appropriately forward the provided information if there is something that the law enforcement or justice center or OMEG needs to know. We will review the cases. If it is beyond central office hands, we are going to send those complaints to the uh, law enforcement justice center or OMEG if necessary. So there are steps that will be taken, just not asked. So that's the first part of the broker review. The next thing is support brokers also have the opportunity to respond and send additional information. So if you know that somebody complained against a broker, you can always reach out to us and tell us, hey, this is what really happened. Give us more information. We are not going to disregard those information. We are going to keep it in consideration. The involved parties are required to respond. If there is an investigation done or if we want more information, we are going to send out the letters and things to the, to the uh, um, parties who, who send the compliance. So we, they'll have to respond to us in time. So in this scenario, as of now, you can see all this broker authorization and the broker review is pointed towards SD broker mailbox, which I will be reviewing. So I will be looking at the case by case, but Chad will be the person who doesn't know what is happening will review that. So he will be the Next step person, if, there, if, if it needs to be reviewed more. So he will not have any kind of um, un the understanding of the whole case. He'll look at it in a clear view and, and review the case. And then if it still is, needs some information determination, it will be sent out to the council office so they will look at it. Uh, that may decide to overturn the determination or not. So council's office is also there to review the cases, the brokers. If there is more issues, you can appeal for the case. So it's not one step. Just because there is a complaint, it's not like revoke the person immediately and then nobody knows what happened. That is a step of a review process is what I want to specify in this slide. What are the expectations of brokers and potential outcomes? So 
provide services as outlined in support broker agreement. So if brokers if make sure what is an agreement, an agreement is so important that you sit down and review with the individuals. And, and if you say that you will do some duties per the support broker agreement and you do not follow it, it can say that you didn't do your job for your expectation because you have checked the mark in the support broker agreement and you're not doing it. Then somebody can file a complaint against you guys. Maintain maintenance of systematic knowledge of the person centered planning and support. It's important. Person centered planning is so important. That is why all brokers have to go through the person centered planning training. So to have that knowledge to help the individuals to have for self-direction service. Providing pro proper notification to OPWDD, FI, and participant if support broker wish to discontinue the provision of support broker service. So all of a sudden, you have agreed to work with some individual. You cannot stop working with somebody all of a sudden. You have to notify the DDRO, the OPWDD, the FI, and most importantly, the individual whom you serve to, because they look forward for support brokers. I'm not saying that you want to do this, you drop the case and run. There might be some scenarios, some cases, but please share the information with them. Appropriate notification is reducing your caseload. So, not like one or two, but even if it is one or two, if you're reducing the caseload, please let the uh, OPWDD, DDROs, and FI know. If it is a lot of brokers, if some brokers have a lot of caseloads and you're reducing like almost to half of your caseload, please make sure you uh, let everybody know. As I stressed again and again, each case will be reviewed individually. So there's no blanket uh, reauthorization or anything like that that happens. What, what are the outcomes that could happen after we review the cases? Sometimes some brokers will have to go through retraining. We might limit some caseload because if there is a lot of caseload, or if you have a small caseload and you can't maintain it, we will ask you to reduce the caseload. Sometimes it might be a suspension, sometimes it might be a revocation of your authorization or your support broker to be a broker. If there is more, there will be a referral to the Justice Center or OMEG if there is a Medicaid issue. Because remember, support broker service is a Medicaid waiver service and it is with the Medicaid dollars. So these are the potential outcomes that could happen if there is a broker review that is done for a broker. So that is about broker review. Um, sure. I want to just stop for a minute. Sure, and I, and I want to you know reiterate one of the things is where you know, really digging into talking about broker oversight and expectations and, and potential outcomes, um, you know, I do want to enforce that while the main driver for central broker authorization was ensuring accountability for support brokers, um, you know, that, that was something that was being considered, um, you know, all along, and part of this um, part of this initiative is to not implement a, um, a heavy-handed approach to penalize brokers. Rather, the idea is to be able to um, centrally track and be fair and consistent when there are issues um, that do that do come up. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's, these are things that were being handled um, that were being handled previously. Support brokers, um, we want to be able to continue having that independent option um, and in order to do so, this was a, a, a realignment um, 
that fixes some of those things, especially where um, some of that some of that service liability um, lies for independent brokers, making sure you're getting um, development hours and um, and other other aspects. Um, but again, it's not a process to to punish brokers, but rather just to continue making sure that um, that pro that those elements that were previously required and are now further um, clarified continue continue to be to be met. So as Chad was talking, I just looked at one question, one simple one I thought I'll quickly answer. Who do brokers go when there is an issue with their files? <laughs> you still can reach out to your DDROs um, for the help because, as I said, DDRO is your point person. So now the most important email that everybody should have it on, like, email um, is sdbroker at opwdd.ny.gov for sending out any forms and things like that. Please, as I explained earlier, do not send your current training documents to that mailbox. We will be happy to review. We are trying to keep a consistent um, way of answering any questions that has been sent. Um, we have, as Chad said in the beginning, we have recorded this PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, we will be able to share with everyone. We will let you guys know when it will be shared. Um, if there is any additional training, we will announce it well in advance so everybody can join us to the WebEx. So I'm just going to wait to see if there was any other questions that needs to be answered. So we've got um, literally hundreds of questions that come in and have come in and we're not going to be able to answer every single one. Um, however, we, you know, we want to reiterate to people the importance of going back and reviewing the Support Broker Administrative Memorandum. Um, many if not most of the questions coming in are directly answered in those memoranda. It's very important um, that both support brokers and fiscal intermediaries are um, are becoming familiar with these with these new new documents. Um, a couple of the frequent questions that have come in: um, we know there's a lot of unpaid brokers out there, frequently um, family members who are only providing support broker services to their own children or other other family members. Um, and one of the questions that came up a lot for these unpaid brokers is, do must they fill out and send in a broker authorization form to obtain an authorization number? And the answer is no, it is not mandated. The authorization is a billing standard um, where there is no billing being generated by an unpaid broker. Um, there is not a requirement for authorization. Um, the same expectations established before in that unpaid brokers, whether it's a person acting as their own support broker or a family member who's doing it on an unpaid basis, um, will still be expected to have gone through the broker trainings and have a, um, a support broker agreement in order to establish that they understand um, what's required as part of the support broker um, support broker role. However, unpaid brokers who may be interested in expanding and acting as and becoming paid brokers in the futures are um, are free to fill out the forms and submit for an authorization number now or in the future. Um, now could be a good time to do it to become to become grandfathered. So it, it is entirely permissible for unpaid brokers to obtain an authorization number now. Um, though, again, where there's no billing being generated, you would not need the authorization number as part of the current billing standard, um, but you could do so in order to um, be able to um, be billing in the future without having to go through the authorization process later. One of the other questions that came up had to deal with unpaid brokers and background checks. As Shobana detailed earlier, there's no change to background check requirements. Broker authorization is separate and apart 
from um, required background checks that are part of um, OPWDD regulations and are required there. Specifically for unpaid brokers, I can't give a blanket answer for whether or not an unpaid broker is going to be required to do a background check. Um, providers are going to be looking at the regulations, especially the new detail provided in the volunteering ADM that, differ, that speaks to the differences between natural supports and, um, and volunteers and looking at that role in a person-specific situation. Um, so they may still be needing to require um, background checks for unpaid brokers if it's determined that those um, those regulations apply as a volunteer. However, if somebody's determined to be excluded as a um, natural support, then they would not. But again, that's going to be up for to the provider agency who um, who is going to be accountable for um, you know for background checks where where applicable. Um, another question that came up um, many times was from people who provided support brokerage through um, multiple agencies, you know, multiple part-time broker jobs, or both worked as independent brokers and as agency brokers. And the question being, do they need to obtain multiple authorization numbers? The answer to that is no. Um, each authorization number will be specific to the broker and will apply both to independent and agency or multi-agency status. Another very frequent question had to do with support broker agreements and um, and what support broker agreement is going to apply in terms of starting the clock for the circle of support um, annual requirement. As indicated on page four of the stand new standards ADM for support brokerage, it is the initial support broker agreement. So it's the first support broker agreement a broker has um, with a person they're providing brokerage to. Um, that may be an agreement that is signed as part of the startup process. As before, the billing standards do not differentiate um, at all between ongoing and startup support brokerage. Um, the service standards are identical. That remains the same here. Um, you know, the billing is for support brokerage, not for startup brokerage, not for ongoing brokerage. Um, so once an agreement is signed, that clock starts with the, with the recognition that um, if for some reason there's not a budget for 180 days, the, the requirement is diminished from two to one. Um, in order to, you know, recognize that sometimes people um, indicate they want to work with a broker, but, um, you know, life happens and sometimes they need to remain in, um, in current programs for a while and they do not actually work on getting a budget together for, for some time. Um, another situation to consider is uh, it might not be the first time you've worked with somebody, a discontinuance in the agreement that is, you had a broker agreement, provided broker services with somebody, then they left, found a new broker for a period of time, and came back. Um, we would look at that as a continuous period of providing brokerage being when the year happens. So once the support broker service is, um, is terminated, that is, the person is no longer receiving brokerage from the broker, um, and goes to a new broker or goes back to traditional services or what the situation is, and then say a year later comes back and starts new brokerage, that new continuous period, um, the first initial agreement as part of that new period would be the initial support broker agreement that would trigger the clock to start. So we're just gonna take a minute and review some of these several hundred questions and see if we can come up with a couple other trended questions um, to reply to verbally here. Okay, so we've got a couple other question areas we, we want to touch on. Again, there's a lot of questions pouring through, but we're trying to hit the, hit the frequent ones. Um, one question that was fairly common is a, is a lot of people were, um, were coming 
up and looking at these authorization forms and um, many of them were pouring in already completed as we were talking. Um, other people were indicating that they were having technical difficulties um, in, in signing those. I know our kind of resident technical expert here, uh, you know, is, is advising to, you know, help get troubleshoot help directly from Adobe. Um, that's, you know, that's the source. Make sure that you're using an up up-to-date version of the software that's available. It should be cross-compatible. As well, uh, do may, um, if you want to be sure that you're opening the form in the correct program, what I would advise you to do is to download it to, say, your desktop, right-click on the form to open it with Adobe Acrobat. You'll see that as uh, one of the options. Uh, either it'll come up automatically or you'll under open with there'll be an arrow and then that'll be one of the options from there. Click that, open that, and then fill in the form utilizing that software. If you do it in your browser, all functionality may not be available. Um, so I'm gonna turn another question, another question to you that came up a lot was brokers asking at what frequency should they be updating their caseload list, acknowledging that this initial broker authorization form includes current caseloads. Are they going to have to continue doing that in the future as they expand their, expand their caseloads? So as you know, when you're expanding your caseload, you have, you're now the new process is to send the support broker agreement. So when we have the agreement, we know if like Nal Smith is going to go from four cases to five cases, the fifth one will have a support broker agreement. We, we will know that your case is going up. You don't have to redo the authorization form again. So please make sure to send your support broker agreements uh, once it is signed by you and the participant so we can track your yeah. roster. And, um, and another question that came up a lot was around the mentorship and protege um, program and, and relationship and where there are, are training hours and um, you know this might be related to my earlier comment regarding you know payments for that program again this is you know we're not directly funding um, the training the training credits um, however you know it is it is noted that there may be services that meet all applicable standards that are part of the mentor training, mentor protege relationship. So there, there could be circumstances where there are um, legitimate billable hours generated out, but what we'd note there is that it's the similar service standards apply, all same service standards apply, there, there's no difference, so there must be signed broker agreement, service documentation, an applicable budget. Um, so there's not a separate billing aspect for mentorship. Um, however, yes, that could occur um, similar to on-site ComHab as detailed in the self-direction guidance. Uh, there may be an instance where there's on-site training from an experienced staff to a new staff and that could, could impact billable hours. So I know there are still a lot of a lot of questions coming in. We want to remind everybody um, that that again the self-direction broker, the SD broker at opwdd.ny.gov um, is continues continues to be the primary source and um, somebody want to jump in and yeah I just saw one question and I want to say it says if one person has two brokers do they both need separate broker agreements again if both the brokers have to bill you need a broker agreement so a broker agreement is important if they are going to bill and it should be also in the budget template as the backup broker so make sure those standards are very clear. You need the broker agreement in order to build. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for attending today's, today's WebEx. Um, we will continue to look at the questions and examine things coming in and continue to work on 
getting out helpful guidance um, in order to um, you know, continue providing providing clarification around the details of implementing this um, centralized broker authorization program. Um, and so we are now going to sign off. And once again, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>